When you see the performance of Napoli against Roma, when you saw them against Atalanta, where they played some good football, but then lost complete control when they didn't get the penalty uh, against Juventus. Yeah. Then you see them against Salzburg, they didn't play particularly well, they got a decent result. It looks to me as though Ancelotti's slightly lost his way and the team have slightly lost their yeah. way. And they're not the main challenges anymore for Juventus. Well, I'm going to put my um, Gab hat on here mm -hmm. and pretend to be Gab so that I can then argue with myself, essentially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, I feel like with Ancelotti, what's going on now is that it's an amalgamation of things. Mm. And I think he's reached his level of frustration. I think that being sent off against the game, um, against uh, mm. what, the Atalanta, Rata Atalanta was ridiculous. By the was way. ridiculous. Yeah. And he kept saying that he was being just sort of like, you know, my professionalism is being called into question. And he doesn't like that. I feel like he's not really, He's finding himself in a position where he doesn't need to defend himself or his mm. actions, and he hates that. And this is being again put in, you know, put into question with our, with Di Laurentiis, who's asking him to do all these things that he doesn't mm. necessarily want to do. He's going to be like, "I'm the manager of these players. I know how to do my job. I don't want to do what you're asking me to do." I think that he's also looking at this team that do play on their day the most fantastic, the best football, football sometimes. You know, in absolutely. Serie. And then they're not getting the results. And this is where Gab comes in and says, well, as long as they're creating the chances, it was 29 shots against mm. Salzburg, of which only four were on target. Mm. And this is the time where I say to you, like, yeah, Lozano is fine, but, you know, he doesn't have any continuity. But the problem being, it's not just that they're creating, uh, that they are creating chances, they're not taking them. They're now looking more vulnerable at the back. I'm a great fan of Koulibaly. Yeah. But he's had a poor two or three weeks against Atalanta. A couple of balls were played in behind him. He let runners go and they scored. He committed the foul for the penalty yeah. against Salzburg, which was a, was a poor challenge. So he's not at his very best. He can't make up his mind who's going to play centre-half, Maximovic or Manolas. They've, they've changed a couple of times. So there's one or two areas of problem for, for yeah, Ancelotti absolutely. at the moment. And I think that you could really feel the absence of Alain against yes. Salzburg. Um, I think that there isn't enough in midfield to contain what's going on. And I think with Koulibaly, you see, initially, I, I did think it was the fact mm. that he had lost Albiol. And what Albiol is, is perhaps not the world's you know, most athletic centre back. Mm. But he's a little bit like Andrea Barzali in the mm. sense that he really understands and reads the game. He is so tactically intelligent mm. and sort of understands how to direct from the back. And Koulibaly is then that, you know, wonderfully technically uh, gifted player who sort of, you know, will have the grit, the determination. And then he just, you know, executes, right? Mm. And I think what you have now is two of those guys, but no one to really direct because that's what Manuel asked for and 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 Kulibali So that's the defensive is. side. Let's go back to the the forwards, because when things have been struggling, he, he really wants to play with Dries Mertens and Lozano up front, with Insigne down one side, Kai Hun down the other side. Yeah. When things I start like that, to go yeah. wrong, mm. straight away he brings Milik and Llorente on for the last 15, 20 minutes of a game. So he thinks that must be the way to get themselves back into a game. Yeah. So why why not? put a big one and a small one on at the start yeah. and then do the same. I don't think Lozano and Mertens work well together. I'm, I've been disappointed with Lozano. I, I have to agree with you on Lozano and I think, you know, time, give mm. give someone time. Even Good though, goal against Salzburg. Yeah, well, even though, yes, Lozano also is one of these players who always seems to score in his debut and, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and do that. But but I um, I, I agree because actually Milik has been in quite good form. Mm. Mm. Milik is scoring goals, but it's the sort of all or nothingness of either mm. we have a big man attack or we have mm. a, a small man when, attack. Because whenever I'm doing commentary and I, I see Mertens and Milik together, I think, well, that's a good combination. Mm. Mertens will come off and start being the creative player. he get himself to play little balls. Milik will be good in the box. He'll hold up the play. And then I'm disappointed when I see Lozano up front with Mertens. Mm. I just think that's a better conversation, it, Milik and, and it, Mertens. And it's a manager who you know can and does come up with creative mm. solutions. I think he did away to Salzburg. He did against Liverpool. He is someone who has the ability to come up with creative tactical solutions, but it does feel like in a lot of these games recently, Napoli have sort of got stuck in a very re repetitive mindset and they don't know how to get out of it. I do think, because this is since our last podcast, isn't it, the Atalanta game, they mm. were very unlucky. I think that decision... Because he, he actually came up with a, a slightly different tactic in the Atalanta game, because usually he plays that three-and-a-half-man defence where he puts the right-back tucked in, Lorenzo, and it's Mario Rui that breaks forward down the left-hand side. Insigne comes in off the left. He did it the other way round in mm. that Atalanta game. So it was Di Lorenzo that almost played as an outside right. Callejon went through the inside right position, so much so that Gasparini had him man-marked for the last 20 minutes of the game because he was causing so many problems. So he did adjust yeah, the tactic and, slightly. And, and for me, Di Lorenzo is, you know, I saw a lot of, like, for me, over-analysis of suddenly Lorenzo is the aggressor and bringing his arm down. 
Camille Rente has rugby tackled mm. in, in the penalty oh, area, yeah. and it should be a penalty mm. for, for Napoli before, before the Atlantic get a chance. And do you know what VAR, because I'm, I'm doing the game, and we get the pictures from VAR, yeah. you know what they were looking at? What? They were looking at Rente could have been sent off for the elbow. I mean, yes, it's just ridiculous. It was a ridiculous, ridiculous. ridiculous. absolutely but ridiculous. But I do, I, I do want to come back to Angelotti on this because I, I, I you know, God knows, I, mm. I think he's one of the world's mm. most fantastic coaches, and I, I will always sing his praise. But I do think he needs to take. So a you agree bit with of something with the Gabby Markov? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do love him. I, I certainly don't think he's of the same level that I, I don't know, the likes of Fabio Capello. But anyway, going back to stuff. Yeah, I think that he needs to shoulder some of the responsibility because you know this is a good team. Mm. But I think that what he doesn't understand is he's always been in charge of like, you know, your Bayern Munichs, your PSGs, your Real Madrids, your Milans, which had wonderful players that you could exchange and rotate. And they will always understand because they are very highly intelligent and individually mm. skilled players. Napoli is that too. But if you have someone like Lozano, he needs continuity because mm. he can't build anything. Mm. So, of course, now he's not going to thrill you because he's going to thrill you up when he's played for 20 minutes here or an hour there. This is the first time he's played a full game. Despite you loving Ancelotti, though. Yeah, and then you I look at Milik and you... and, and none and I just feel like sometimes you have to treat these players for the fact that they are not World Cup stars, mm. but perhaps players that you need to give a little bit more continuity to, especially Milik, and, and take responsibility for that. But there is just one, one other quick thing I sort of wanted to ask Stuart about, again, from the sort of former player side of it, which is, you know, this concept of Ritiro is, is so Italian, and I and I'm myself always wonder how, clearly it's worked for some teams, some situations, but how that's going to impact your morale as a player to get told you can't go home to your family. I think especially... English if... players would not have it at all. Yeah. I mean, I remember one Christmas when we we were away for three or four days and the players, and I was captain of Coventry at the time, and the players almost went on a revolt because we weren't allowed to go home. And it's the wrong thing to do uh, in England. If Italian players are used to it, uh, so be it. But going back to Ancelotti, he's got to turn it around pretty quickly, mm. otherwise come the end of the season, he could be in trouble. <sighs> Well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.